Alrighty. Cool. Welcome to this very first inaugural edition of Movie Talk with Jordan and Stefan. We are continuing the book talk format, expanding it now to discuss cinema. And as you can imagine, as you can probably glean from our uh, discussions of books, our discussions of movies are similarly uh, very interesting, uh, rich uh, treasure troves of discussion. So that's what we're beginning with this series, and I think we picked a great one to start with, not necessarily because the movie was great, but just because the, uh, the it's a great source of um, discussion and ideas and that kind of thing, and that is the 2017 American remake of Ghost in the Shell. And this is uh, Ghost in the Shell, the 1995 Mamoru Oshii Ghost in the Shell is a landmark film in anime, in the history of anime, because, uh, and Stefan and I were actually just talking about this before we started recording, uh, but whether, you know, if, if you're like me, on the one hand, you might think that um, it's a landmark film because of the scope and the ideas of it and that it is an exceptional film, or as Stefan is pointing out, and I'll let him elaborate on this, it was an important film because of the uh, op opening of doors that it brought for Western audiences to appreciate anime. And for that reason, it's kind of remembered alongside Akira and some other movies like that. Uh, so re uh, whatever the case, the original Ghost in the Shell film, which was adapted from a manga, is a very prominent and very important film uh, in its own right, and it has a huge cult following. So when it was brought to the United States with this American remake, there was a lot of trepidation, a lot of controversy. Uh, there was some controversy about the character of Motoko Kusanagi being whitewashed. I actually addressed that in a video of my own uh, called You Can't Whitewash Anime, uh, you can check that out uh, in my uh, video library on YouTube if you're interested. Uh, just making the point that uh, while Motoko Kusanagi has a Japanese name, she and the other characters are not ethnically Japanese. They're not supposed to imply an ethnic Japanese background. They're kind of raceless, uh, just kind of non-entities, if you will, racially. Anyway, uh, so setting all of that aside, I want to talk about the mood itself and um, the as far as I, as far as I'm concerned like my very worst suspicions about this movie about what this movie would be were confirmed uh, I, I ended up the only showing I could get to was a 3d showing so for the cost of several hardcover books I got myself you know two hours or whatever of mediocre entertainment in 3d and uh, Honestly, the, the parts I enjoyed the most were the just there were these beautiful uh, computer generated flyby sequences of um, the futuristic uh, Tokyo and all of that, the cyberpunk world and all that. Those were great. And if it had been 90 minutes of just that, like it's one of those old uh, mind's eye computer animation video things with like Jan Hammer in the background and all that. If that had been it, I probably would have had a good time, but instead I had to sit and watch one of my favorite movies uh, be urinated on for a couple of hours, and it was just agonizing. So, Stefan, I'm going to turn it over to you. What do you think? Uh, this is hard to say because there's lots of me that uh, was going to be a let down a big deal uh, as I was walking into the theater. But because I'm a, such a big fan of the Ghost in the Shell franchise, not just the movie, I'm talking uh, Solid, Solid State Society, which is the 2007 film. Uh, there's the Arise series, which came out in 2013. Uh, the Standalone Complex, both series. Like I, I know these characters. I know what they're doing. So you're going to expect a, a lot more tighter script, a lot less to happen. So there's all kinds of homages to the first movie, to... Uh, the the Solid State Society movie, the, the second Impact, or sorry, the second uh, gig a series, uh, and they combine plots, they combine characters, and that's fine. So those little bits I was really appreciative because it's like, oh, someone's paying attention. 
But of course, you couldn't have enough time to expand on those characters, expand on the world building, expand on the plot. So you'll see scenes that's like, hey, this is the the the, the tank scene from the first movie. It's like almost the same. You know, the columns are running around with a slight twist. So it's like, okay, fine. They they, they did what they could to get around that. Now, it doesn't mean that there's anything special about it as a, the first movie uh, as well as the series, which dealt a lot with philosophical themes, philosophical concepts. What is the soul? What does it mean to be alive? How do you how do you exist in this sort of society where everyone's a machine or half machine? Uh, that wasn't really looked upon. What they did instead, and this I thought was actually kind of smart, even though it wasn't executed very well, was to focus on the character of the protagonist, which is the the major and uh, they, they gave her a different name. And that was very strange for everyone who knows the series. You're like, why is she called this? We know that's not her name. Uh, and that actually explains, as the story goes on, uh, why, you know, the, you know what the whitewashing, all the, the differences of her appearance. It's like, well, her appearance doesn't matter if she's so fabricated that uh, if they mm-hmm. can reprogram her mind, they can reprogram her language, her body shouldn't matter. And that's what ends up happening. Now, because of that, they end up doing a lot of melodrama. They end up ha- introducing elements that were never in the story at all at any of the series. And I think that was to just have the average uh, viewer go, oh, okay, she she used to be human, and she used to have a mom, and she used to do this with her friends and whatever. So they were doing a very uh, difficult attempt. I, I don't think it was executed very well, but at least they attempted it to focus on the protagonist, which is always a good idea in stories. So uh, I ended up leaving the theater kind of positive, which is surprising because I love this series to death, and it uh, it wasn't as bad as I as I thought it would be. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we've got. So like I said already, I mean, uh, within what you're saying, I started taking notes. Um, Absolutely. I, I think. What was happening here, some very interesting, or some very curious, I should say, things happened with how they went about making this. You're right about the the, uh, the whitewashing, or, or the, the answer to the whitewashing, that, you know, if she's, um, uh, you know, synthetic and replaceable and all that, that was one thing that's actually completely distorting, completely different from any of the originals, from uh, from the original manga, the original movie, the, the series, all of that. Which was, if you remember, in the um, uh, going back to the movie, you know, there are scenes where she sees uh, her model all over town. You know, she's walking, she's just uh, walking around town. She sees her model of uh, cyborg being used to model clothing in a dress store window, and I think like a waitress or an office girl or something like that. So that's something that's completely different. Where they said she's the first of her kind, and in, in the show she's in the series she's not. But I think you're right. The way they were setting this up, they set this up to feel almost. You're right, like a prequel. Where does Mitoko Kusanagi come from? Now, I'm going to say this. I think the best way to discuss this is to have a uh, total spoiler policy on the movie, on the original movie, the manga, everything, because I don't think we're going to get our point across. So I will say here and now, we're going to discuss everything that happens in this uh, and everything that happens in the previous Ghost in the Shell incarnations. So uh, if you're waiting, if you're holding out on any of that, uh, you know, you should probably stop listening now because everything's up on the table for discussion so if there's that one episode of the series that you're waiting to see go see it and come back we don't want i don't want to step on anybody's toes with that anyway that said it's ob- it does feel like this is the story of motoko kusanagi where did motoko kusanagi come from and yeah by the end of the movie she is motoko kusanagi and so where did she come from which would be fine I would be okay with that. And it was obvious that they were starting, they were trying to set this up as a series. And I get that. I'm totally okay with that idea. Except they set up all of these homages to the first movie. If you look at the canon of Ghost in the Shell, the Ghost in the Shell uh, movie, the, the first movie, tells the story of Matoko Kusanagi eventually abandoning her 
uh, human or cyborg human body thing to be a uh, non-physical entity on the internet uh, com that's combined with her um, mystery uh, antagonist throughout the film who turns out to want to combine his programming with hers uh, to kind of create a cybernetic child, so to speak. Uh, which is a, an idea very akin to uh, William Gibson's Neuromancer and that kind of thing. And so he wants, uh, this, that's the that's where the first story, the first film leaves off. Then there's Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence, which picks up after she's gone and Bato's the main character. So Standalone Complex and Solid State Society, the TV series, they are prequels to all of that. So it felt like, and I think the, because those series had a huge following in the U.S., especially on Adult Swim, I feel like the filmmakers were making a, a, a genuine attempt to appeal more to that than to the original film. And I think that's probably, I mean, I love it all, don't get me wrong, but it sounds like, Stefan, you're probably more a fan of the series. And so I think that's probably why it resonated more with you. But here's the thing that stops it from working for me. Throughout this movie, they recreate all, and I mean all, of the original famous scenes from the 1995 movie. And, I mean, people who know the movie, picture the film in your head right now, okay, the, uh, the scene of uh, Kusanagi being built uh, at the beginning, that's there. But it's in a completely different context where it's she's being built for the you know first time. Uh, then we have the the famous scene of her waking up in front on the little pallet in her room in front of the city. That's there. But then as the actual plot develops, these scenes happen, but they occur in a different order for different reasons. We have the famous invisible kickboxing scene in the harbor where she beats up the guy that's had his uh, brain hijacked and all that, had his soul hacked, uh, as they put it, or his ghost hacked. Uh, they, they have that scene in the interrogation afterwards and all that. They have that, but it's in service of a different plot line from the movie. They have the famous uh, scuba diving scene where she gets back on the boat with Bato and uh, you know undresses in front of him and there's this awkward moment. Uh, that's there but it's in the service of a different plot. The tree of life is there. The tree of life scene is there to serve a different plot. The big scene at the end where she gets on top of the tank and rips it open and her, you know, and, and her body comes apart and all of that, that's there for a different plot. And then we have kind of a create a kind of a recreation of the final moment from the from the 95 film the anime where the puppet master says hey here's why i'm coming to you i want to do this let's go off and do this and she agrees to it uh before you know before her body is blown away and bato has to find a uh, a child body to replace it they have that scene and then they resolve it differently for a different plot and it's hard to put that in to to really comprehend what i'm saying here until you actually see the movie but that's what I had a problem with. It was like it was this weird thing where it's like we're obviously trying to do something else with it, but we're it's like we know all of the famous scenes that the fans want to see from the movie. So it's like we'll just show them these things they want to see, but then they ignore all of the metaphor and uh, detail and all of this. And I know it's possible to put all of that into a movie because they put it all into the original movie. So that was the problem I had with it. I don't. It's this weird clusterfuck of we're trying to start <laughs> thing, but we're still going to pay fan service in the most shallow, fickle way possible. Yeah, it was an amalgamation of plots and characters throughout the entire twenty odd years that this has been a franchise. But it suffers from the problem of going to a movie and trying to be, play it safe while trying to keep people understanding what's going on, and that's what happens with. Uh, franchises like Star Trek. Star Trek works fantastic as a series. You have time to have political intrigue and tension and, and scientific issues. But as soon as you go to the movies, it's like, okay, well, we don't have time to talk about all these things. We need our next action beat to happen. So that's kind of what happens, not really in the first movie. Um, it's kind of the opposite of what happens in the second movie, where Innocence is just this gigantic art smorgasbord 
of just beautiful vistas and visuals and you're like what, what is going on so it's yeah, if you're just interjecting if you're the kind of person that likes to watch movies high ghosts in the shell innocence is your hog heaven anyway go ahead. right so there's there's characters there for the for the sake of having the characters as homages and they didn't do anything with them like the biggest one uh i that i noticed was uh Saito, Saito, he pops up in the last 15 minutes of the movie and he has this wire popping out of his eye and you're like, who the hell is Saito? Uh, what is he going to do? Oh, he's a sniper. How do you know that? He takes out a, a helicopter with one bullet. You're like, what? How did he do? Like, it's just stuff like that that doesn't really connect or work, but they had to put it in because it's Saito. Um, there was no, there was no, bot, there was no Buma, there was no Paz. Uh, Instead, so they invented a character called Ladria, some chick who was on... Yeah who's on the team, and you're like, who, who is that? I, I don't know who that is. Why did they even do that? There's no reason. Um, ich, Ichikawa is uh, some black dude who, you know, no backstory, no explanation who he is or what he does. There's no focus on the, the major as a spec ops specialist. She's not a, uh, well, as a result of the first movie, she meshes with the puppet master, and she becomes this expert or wizard-level hacker, but there's no mention of her doing any hacking. The only thing she, thing she does, which is a deep dive, which anyone can do who has a cybernetic brain. So it's kind of like, okay, why is this special? Why is she special? The only thing that's special is she's the first of her kind to be completely removed from a human uh, shell. That's it. That's never really uh, a problem uh, it, throughout the entire series of the franchise, so they, they wanted to focus, and they used that as a crutch to say, okay, well, we're going to, you know, use this, this template, we're going to get rid of her memories, we're going to use her as a weapon, or as a whatever. So they took the two antagonists from the, the second gig, and they slammed that into the plot of the first movie. And I'm not saying you can't do these, you can't do anything crazy like that. You can do a massive amalgamation of ideas from a franchise that works. You could totally do that it's whether you can do it effectively and within the time constraints of a movie. And I don't think you can in this regard because uh, even uh, the Solid State Society movie, which I actually thought was pretty good, it's more Star Trek the series than it is Star Trek the movies. It's a lot of talking. There's a lots of questioning. What, does it, what, do, what are these entities, what are they doing? Are they human? Are they AI? Are they a combination of both? What are they trying to do? Do they think they're still alive? Do they think they're thousands of years old? Like what's... What's keeping the, these these things going? Those those conflicts and those uh, philosophical co uh, concepts are not there or are not here in this movie. So that was disappointing. Although I was expecting it not to be. So it's like okay, they obviously can't get these high end uh, ideas that we want from science fiction. So they're going to focus on on the action, and they're going to have to focus on the, the protagonist, which I thought was a smart idea for a movie, but it didn't really connect very well either way. Yeah. Well, that was what I, I mean, there, there were a few things that I liked. Uh, what, what was interesting to me was they got just one fantastic actor after another for this thing. And what was interesting was, is like, if you were going to pick the exact actors that you would need for a great art house film, you would pick these actors, you know, Scarlett Johansson has always made her, uh, her a name for herself doing uh, doing art films. You know, her big break was what Lost in Translation. You know, she's always been an, an actress like Natalie Portman, who tends to gravitate towards more art driven roles. Michael Pitt is in this, who's a fantastic actor. If you've ever seen um, The Dreamers, it was absolutely amazing art film. One of my favorite actors, Juliet ben or actresses, Juliet Binoche. You know, if you've seen. Uh, Kieslowski's um, Three Colors Blue, uh, which in my mind is the best of the Three Colors series. If you've seen Three Colors Blue, uh, that that same haunting kind of uh, wide-eyed detachment that she has that makes her such a gripping presence. You know, she seems almost like the female Marlon Brando in a way that has that aura on the screen. She's there, and she's great as always. Uh, Beat Takeshi Kitano is in it. And if you don't know who uh, Beat Takeshi Kitano is, 
he has been, well, look him up, first of all, because you've probably seen something that he was in, but he's a very interesting actor in the realm of Japanese cinema because it's almost like he he can be, it's almost like he's equal parts Clint Eastwood and Adam Sandler. I mean, like, he can be the zaniest, silliest comic actor, and then he can turn around and be, like, the most blood-chilling, scary uh, actor that you've ever, you know, intense, intensely, you know, almost psychotically masculine actor you've ever seen, like Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry, and all of that. And he is, he's got some movies, like, have you ever seen Hanabi, um, Fireworks is the English uh, translation. If you've ever seen that in uh, that, you know, it's it's like a Charles Bronson Death Wish kind of thing. In fact, you will say it's a clone of that. And and it's funny because they actually there there's actually a scene where his character takes out this long barreled revolver. Now, if you've seen if you know the original Ghost in the Shell, you know that the long barreled revolver belongs to Togusa, who is completely uh, is kind of a luddite character. He's completely human, has no cybernetic implants. And he carries a primitive 20th century gun around with him because it's, you know, he doesn't want to adopt this future, soulless future technology. But they don't give him that gun. Togus is almost completely useless in this movie. Uh, Beat Takeshi uh, Katano plays the character. I can never say his name. It's, hang on, I've got it. Um, uh, I've got it in front of me. Um, uh, Aramaki, that's it. Uh, Aramaki. He plays Aramaki, who's the older dude. He's the leader of Section 9 and all that. And so they give him the long-barreled revolver in this, and it's so nakedly obvious why they did that. They did that because uh, Beat Takeshi Kitano is famous for, just Takeshi Kitano, is famous for these Charles Bronson, Clint Eastwood type characters, and they gave him a moment to do that. To, you know, there, there are shots in there, if you've seen Hanabi, there are shots in there, or his other movies like Outrage and that kind of thing, where he's a mob boss and things like that. Um, there are scenes, there are shots in the shootout that he gets involved in that are like perfect recreations of shots from, um, the, uh, from, from those movies. And it was such an obvious thing as kind of a, a film buff on Japanese. I love Japanese cinema. And as kind of a film buff in that area, it was so aggravating because, again, yeah, it was like they used, they, they hit all of the fan service of presenting these things, these classic things, but did nothing with it, you know? I mean, it, to, to try to put it in, um, to, to, to try to put it in perspective, I mean, it's like... Um, you know, it's 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 like um, God. I can't. I I, I want to say okay. It's like you're. It's it's like they a while ago they made a remake of the movie Deep Throat. Uh, Vivid made a remake of of Deep Throat, the famous pornographic film. And the only similarity it has to the original is that you have an actress that can deep throat. That's it. It's a different story, different characters, different plot. You know, one of them's named Linda, and that's it. And that might be kind of a tasteless example, but it's like the first thing that comes to mind where it's literally like you just have this mechanical recreation of something from the original and the rest is totally cut off from it. And that's that. I mean, that's where it was. And that's I want, one thing I wanted to bring up. And this is something we had talked about, Stefan, I think a while ago. You had some interesting comments about this one thing from when we both saw the trailer a while back. And. That was um, that was that. There's a um, you know one of the one of the famous iconic scenes that is recreated for the uh, movie is the scene of Motoko Kusanagi or the major uh, standing on top of the skyscraper and disrobing and dropping down, free falling, and and uh, as she's free falling, she turns invisible, and it's so that she can. Uh, interrupt uh, this business meet, this meeting that's going on between the uh, mo you know, mob families and business tycoons and everything. And, uh, but she's not, when she disrobes, it's not, in the movie, it's a human, ex the exterior is a human body. It looks like a naked woman. In, the, in this movie, when she disrobes, I understand they were going for a PG-13 uh, rating and everything, and obviously, you know, I don't even Scarlett Johansson. I don't think you could pay her enough money to spend as much time naked as 
uh, Motoko Kusanagi is in the original movie. I, I get all of that, and that you know, you you would have probably. 30 minutes of naked Scarlett Johansson if you did that and that would be, you know, I'm sure that would be well received, but uh, they're not, obviously they're not going to do that and they want this to play in theaters, but anyway pulling, when she pulls off her clothes and she's not it's not a human body, it's very obviously a cyborg you know, we've got these plates and, you know, it's this kind of like uh, you know, no, uh, no nipples on the boobs and no uh, no anatomical correctness. You know, there's no genitalia and all of that, no ass crack, any of that. And it's it doesn't work. It, it, it takes away, you know, it, it's, it, instead of saying, instead of the effect is supposed to be, you look at this and you think this is a beautiful naked woman and then you find out it's a machine, you know. And that's, that's what's, what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to screw with your head that way. And so we don't get that. But then the most ridiculous thing of all happens is they recreate, again, the shootout in the, um, in the, the uh, high-rise um, office building that happens. They recreate that scene, but she becomes uninvisible during the shootout. And then she's talking to Bato afterwards, which is different from the, uh, from the original, but she's talking to Bato afterwards, and she gets mad about something that's said, and she turns around and storms off, and when she storms off, she becomes invisible again. And it's like she's be just becoming invisible out of spite. The reason you do that was for the tactical advantage when you're shooting these people up, you know? But she does, and, and that, again, I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I know you had some from back then, but that that was one of those big deal breakers for me. Yeah, well, this is the, the production house being as safe as possible. That's why they hired uh, that actress. That's why... Uh, they didn't have any nude scenes. That's why they didn't have any. They they got rid of the kissing scene. I noticed yeah. at least at least in my in my uh, version of the film uh, of the, the 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 model that they hired as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it was like like why are you getting rid of these very tame scenes or why are why aren't you going back to the the original reference material where in the manga you know uh, Tokusa is he does have a cyber brain. Uh, uh, she does have a, a a lesbian experience with her girlfriends in the third chapter. You know, these are these are all things that are very adult and very uh, mm -hmm. serious. So, uh, yeah, they they played it safe, and I, I that's that's how this film made it to to the the theaters. Is they had to do all these hurdles. They had to they cut things down, and and that's a shame to people who enjoy the the material. But you also understand this movie wouldn't have been made if it wasn't for that. So. The problem I have, though, is the production value. It's so high, and they cost so much money. I think it was 110 American million dollars yeah. to make this thing, where if you watch uh, Solid State Society, which came out in 2007, that was like over $3 million to yeah. make. And it's, it's going to be way more entertaining, way more interesting, uh, and exactly from the, uh, the, off, from the ending of the, the first series of uh, Standalone Complex. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, these things are, you know, you, you, you kind of guess that's what's going to happen, and you, you sort of expect, like, your expect my expectations were, were pretty low, and that's what I had walking into it. Still, you evaluate it as a movie, it's pretty weak. Um, you try to see the, the drama, and it's really difficult to see the drama because the, the backstory of the major was never really addressed. She's always been disconnected. She's always, all the characters have always been disconnected from their humanity. So to try to humanize that, to give her a backstory as, as part of reveals of the plot, uh, you, it could work. It could definitely work. They could definitely do it that way. It didn't. And that's why I was sort of sad. It's like, okay, well, is that really a bad thing? Because the original message is to have people dispossessed in their reality of this cybernetic world. And you have all these, these consumerism, there's all these vivid colors, it's like Times Square on crack, you know, there's all these images popping out of buildings, the size of buildings, advertisements of God knows what else, what, it, you know, it's this very uh, hybridized world of, of technology and spirituality and, and color and imagery. So it's almost what you were expecting with the Innocence movie which was pretty much just a, a big trip of, of visuals. 
uh, just given real world actors. So if you're going to do real world actors, you have to do some really good drama. And that's the only thing I could really be dramatic about was, I think, Bato. Uh, mm. Some moments with Aramaki, I think, were good. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they just sort of had to use Bato properly. I was, when you saw the trailer with Bato in it, I thought part of that trailer was in the past because Bato didn't have his cybernetic eyes yet. And then you realized, okay, maybe he gets them in this movie. And then that's what ends up happening. So, yeah. you, like, things like that I was expecting. So I wasn't let down because I could just figure it out from looking at the trailer. Uh, so uh, I, was, I was very happy with the, the performances of Bato and Aramaki. Um, I, I was sort of confused with the, the secondary protagonist uh, the primary protag- uh, antagonist, sorry, antagonist. The, the primary antagonist was, eh, you know, evil corporate dude. You know, it's like okay, that's nothing special. It's nowhere near as fascinating as Standalone Complex. The, both series, I mean, Standalone Complex. They they have the the Laughing Man arc, and then they have the Individualist Eleven arc. Both Standalone Complex concepts, uh, simulacrums, uh, people coming together. Uh, unconsciously to perform a, a group event. You know, very interesting ideas. So none of that's really here. And you still have to look at this movie as a form of entertainment and say, okay, if I know nothing about the series, if I know nothing about uh, the, the mangas, the stories, the, the, the lore, how does, it, how does it sit with you? Well, it's, it's visually interesting. Um, there's lots of talk of the futuristic world and what it means to be in this world. Um, but there's that there's not much else. There's not much of people trying to hold on to their humanity. Um, you know, Bato feeds the dogs. Why? Because because there's, <laughs> there's, there's really no, no other explanation that uh, tells us why we're why he's doing the things he's doing. And that was that was one of the major themes in some of the episodes of the series. So Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's supposed to make you feel kind of empty. And in this way, I wasn't as... It, the empty feeling wasn't as destructive and nihilistic as I thought it would have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if it was nihilistic, that would have been very artsy, and that means the director would have a lot more creative control, but again, they were not going to do that because they were playing it safe. Mm-hmm. So you have these these various extremes of the movie or at least of this movie you wanted to to have take place and they never they never do any of those things right absolutely yeah i mean that's that's the thing is it's it's weird it's like you know i think it gets into and one thing i wanted to touch on i think it gets into kind of a problem with uh adapting Japanese movies to an American audience. And in this way, this is where I, this is something that doesn't get talked about enough, but I think is very important is, you know, you want to talk about systemic discrimination and things like that. One thing that I don't like is that whenever there's a successful movie abroad, uh, well, I shouldn't say whenever, but usually when there is a successful movie abroad that does not use, you know, American actors and all of that, it gets remade for the U.S. audience. And I hate that. When, you know, when a new, Amer- when an American blockbuster comes out in Japan, or comes out, they don't remake it in Japan. They uh, put subtitles on it and put it in the mainstream movie theater, and every, or they overdub it, and everybody goes to see it. And so it, it really is, if you want to talk about a kind of cultural whitewashing, it really is that, that we don't, or an appropriate, if you want to talk about cultural appropriation, if you will, a really good use of that word, is we don't, uh, we don't give foreign cinema the respect that foreign cinema audiences give our movies. I saw Ghost in the Shell 2 in the theater, Uh, Ghost in the Shell Innocence. I saw that in the theater with some friends, and, you know, it was subtitled. It wasn't even dubbed yet, but it was subtitled, and it was only because there was this great little art house cinema near where I was going to college, and we could go see those things. 
It's not like, you know, that movie was ever going to get released into the IMAX. You know, our, um, if you think about it, I mean, modern movie theaters are really just like expensive candy stores. You know, it's kind of like uh, Bill Watterson in Calvin and Hobbes said, you know, it's, it's, it's only fun. You know, it's only fun if you can sit in the dark and eat, you know, and that's basically it. Um, this, it just feels like, it, it just feels like there is such a level of cynicism around these adaptations where it's like, you take a movie like this, uh, you take a, a manga, a, an anime, a TV series, all of this stuff that is deeply cerebral and deeply philosophical and has pretty much exclusively an audience that appreciates those things. Like we were saying earlier, you have to... To appreciate Ghost in the Shell, you have to be able to do a lot of talking. You know, put up with a lot of talking, I should say. Because it's very dialogue-driven, and these people are having constant philosophical discussions about the nature of technology and how it affects the human existence and the human identity and all of that. And it's, um, you know, you have to be willing to put up with that. So to make this, they try to take this and make it a movie for uh, mainstream American audiences, and their 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 concepts. Clearly, they were making this movie. the The audience they make these adaptations for is like uh, the Kevin James character in King of Queens, only maybe with mild Down syndrome. You know, big, the the classic big fat bloated. Uh, just all American jackass, obese American jackass that's, you know, never without his 40 ounce soda cup and his Big Mac and all of that. You know, that guy, that's who they're trying to make this for. And I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, it's, it's almost like trying to take uh, the Republic by Socrates and spice it up with fart jokes. I mean, it's, it's so insulting when they do these adaptations. We saw this with um, uh, One Missed Call, which is a Takashi Miike film uh, starring Yua Aida. Uh, I mean, not Yua Aida, she's a porn star, oh my god. <laughs> uh, Kushi Basaki. Um, Kushi Basaki, you know, uh, did one, was in One Missed Call. It was a great Japanese thriller, horror thriller movie. They made it into a total throwaway film over here. The same thing happened when Wes Craven remade Pulse, or Kairo. Um, when he remade Cairo, it was, you know, this like wacky zombie apocalypse movie or something. And Cairo is just this unbelievably subtle, careful film. I mean, it's one of the most delicately structured horror movies that's ever been made. It's a work of art, you know, cinematic art, not just, uh, you know, just B movie horror fluff. They always do this. And it drives me mad because I know they're thinking there have been talks about um, doing uh, a, an American cin a cinematic, an American cinematic adaptation of Neon Genesis Evangelion. Well, we know what that's going to be. It's not going to be this, uh, you know, uh, symbol deeply metaphorical, symbolic coming of age story. It's not going to be about the creator's mental breakdown and battles with depression. It's not going to be about the psychosexual imagery of this uh, apocalyptic future world where these pseudo biblical alien creatures wipe out existence and, you know, in this very metaphorical sense. No, it's just going to be like uh, Transformers, the movie, and it's more Michael Bay bullshit. That's the real problem that we have with cultural appropriation. If you want to talk about cultural appropriation as a problem and as something that needs to be corrected, we need to stop remaking European and uh, Asian cinema and all of that. Just take the original movie. You know what else? The Departed. Have you, if, if you're hearing this, have you seen The Departed? You know, with DiCaprio and all that uh, Scorsese movie. Great film. Not denying that great fantastic movie but it's a remake of a korean film and we should just be bringing these uh the these films into american cinema and promoting them uh but the the bar is so low in this country that we can't have that we can't have nice things you know we 
everything that gets mainstream success or is marketed for mainstream success in the United States is marketed with Mama June, with uh, Mama June and Honey Boo Boo or whatever they're called in mind. You know, dumbass trailer trash hicks. That's who everything is made for, and that's what pisses me off. You know, if if you were to take you know, and I, I said this in um, in my original video about this, and I, I, is this this thing of like it's like they taste fine cuisine and they think, oh well, the American taste buds won't know the difference between this and deep fr deep fat fried dog shit, you know. So that's the problem I have. That's my rant for the night. What do you think, Stefan? Well, there are some exceptions to that rule. Any kind of Miyazaki film, you can't just you know recreate that. There's uh the Edge of Tomorrow, which is based off a manga called All You Need Is Kill. It never even made an animated version. This went straight to a movie back in 2014. This was written, I think, in 2003. So there, there are some minor uh, choices like that. And if ever Evangelion uh, get, gets into a live-action form, Hideki Anno has to be involved. Like He's not going to let someone else take over the reins. He's going to be involved, and he's a control freak. It's kind of like uh, Hideo Kojima with Metal Gear, he has to be involved. And so you're, you're going to expect something amazing on some level. As as crazy as Hideki Anno and Kojima are, uh, if they're involved even in a small way, you're going to get something amazing. So, yeah, I, I, I don't like the uh, the loss or the lack of not focusing on the, the original primary source of the material. Uh, but because it's a movie, it's its own beast. So you have to, you have to go through the hoops... You have to deal with all the the publish all the production studios, all their needs. Uh, you know who to hire, who's gonna. You know, if you spend ten million on an actor and actress, you're gonna expect a, a five million return or a five percent return at the box office opening day or whatever whatever the uh, the numbers are they use to do their marketing nowadays. Uh, because they're struggling. the The movie business is gonna be struggling always with the up and coming uh, online. Uh, TV and movie business there. So they have to figure out how to do it and they're being as safe as possible. So they're not going to take all these risks. But you might see uh, you know, Amazon and uh, Netflix doing much more creative work and doing new series that would be more true to the primary source. So I don't think it's, it's a lose-lose a scenario uh, th as, this, as the years go by. I think it's going to be shaping up. And I'm actually kind of happy that this movie was made. I'm glad it exists. I'm glad that uh, I could have seen, seen it. It was because, I mean, this is pretty much just for the fans. Uh, mm -hmm. This this movie lost to uh, another movie about a, a baby, animated baby yeah. movie. So, I mean, that's, that's just how the Western world is. But I, I'm glad I got to see this movie. It's beautiful. Um, it's a little strange. <laughs> it's not, not exactly what I, what I wanted out of my uh, Ghost in the Shell. But I, I think it did a pretty decent job. Uh, the characters were that were on the screen for more than two minutes uh, were likable. Um, it wasn't a nefarious sort of cackling evil guy at the end, um, although he wasn't too far off. Uh, you know, it wasn't. It didn't have the depth I wanted, but I wasn't expecting it to have depth. Mm -hmm. So, it's the same with Innocence. They, Innocence was this huge movie, and they they cut that down into four parts as a miniseries to to make it consumable to the average uh, anime watcher, so they can see it. And the same with Macross Plus, fantastic movie, cut it down into four episodes, so that you can consume it better. So, yeah, if if editing was involved, I. Yeah, there would be lots of scenes you would cut out. Uh, there's all kinds of techno babble. Actually, no, there isn't that much techno babble, which I was surprised by because the, the series is notorious for having all kinds of viruses and words and terms and very similar to how uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion has all these weird terms that don't make any sense. So, yeah, it, it was Americanized, it was modernized, and... Uh, I, I'm not against that. I'm not against editing stuff for the sake of consumption. I'm against editing stuff uh, for losing the spirit of the original source. And I don't think the spirit was lost here. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was subdued. 
but it wasn't lost. The the idea of being disconnected, the, be, the idea of who you are, what what are you as a result of this change to the to the self, to the to the soul, to the mind, that's still there. It's just not as as glorious. It's not as beautiful and raw as we'd like it to be. So it's I still say it's a great flick to watch. It's not a it's not a great movie, but it's it's if it's for the fans, really. It's it's mm-hmm. a it's a modernization. It's um, a colorful movie. It's a dark movie at times, but uh, it's it's a beautiful movie, and that's that's how I see it. It's a beautiful piece of of setting that characters happen to be in that we know, or at least the fans know. That is probably the best way to put it. And I will say, for all of the bashing it that I've done, I will say. It is a beautiful movie to look at. There, uh, no one can fault them for that. Um, that's that's the one area where they really did hit the nail on the head. They got the look of it, <clears throat> uh, and and uh, very very much so. And there's a lot of good detail work in it. Uh, and so that aspect of it is very well done. And I like I said earlier, the the purely the world. If it had just been walking around in the world and seeing all of the the beautiful imagery there i would have had a great time you know i think so i think this is um uh i think this is good um a a a good uh place to sum it up so the question stefan of course that we always end on is would you recommend it yeah i would it's it's not uh what they intended i think their intention was to focus on the protagonist and in the series, the protagonist is the major who's this untouchable woman who no one, like she's amazing at everything. And that's not what this is. So it shows a lot of, of uh, weakness in the character, which is fine. Uh, but it doesn't have the same level of, of impact. So yeah, I would totally see it, but don't expect to be blown away. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's about right. I would even say... I would say don't see it in the if if you have to see it in the theater, see it in 3D because you need to get the full experience. The only problem with that is you get those cheap ass uh, 3D glasses, and like the ones I got, you know, I was thinking like this must not be my prescription for 3D glasses because they uh, they were always smudgy no matter what. I even a couple times I even got up and went to the restroom and washed them off, and they were still smudgy when I sat down again. And uh, and so it was like you have to decide: do you want to see two out of two blurry images or one blurry image? And one blurry image is obviously better. So, and that's talking about the, trying to watch 3D without the glasses. But the depth of it looks really cool, and it's a good way to see it. But that said, I wouldn't see it in the theater. I think the ideal way to probably to see it is uh, if you have PlayStation VR or Samsung VR or something like that, where you can watch it on a device at home. And still get the 3D experience. I say that because I don't, the, for purely political reasons, I, I don't want this movie to have a big return. I don't want them to try more of this crap. I want, you know, I just want them to come up with new ideas and celebrate the ones that are coming in from Japan. So it, it sounds like a divided vote. I would say see it on Netflix. I think, Stefan, you'd probably say see it in the theater, right? Well, I had to wait a week to get a theater that was 2D. I hate 3D. And uh, I was happy with my tiny movie screen at my cheap ass uh, old school theater. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I I would say wait, wait, wait till it comes to DVD or or Netflix or whatever picks it up. Uh, but it's not it's not a must go see. You don't have to go see it right now. But if you want to take advantage of the visuals, definitely see it in 3D. Super. Okay. Well, I think that's a good note to wrap it up on. And. Thank you for joining us for this first edition of Movie Talk. Uh, We will be uh, back later this month with the next installment of Book Talk. That will be 4321 by Paul Auster. Uh, And then coming up next month, we hope you'll join us for the next installment of Movie Talk, where our movie will be Alien Covenant. I'm very excited about that. People who know me and know my channel know that I am a huge Alien fan. So uh, we have that coming up. Uh, thank you, as always. The, uh, this channel that you're listening to is youtube.com slash jordanowen42. We hope that you will allow us to uh, continue to bring you new uh, films 
and our new discussions, new podcasts, new films, and new discussions of the arts on this channel by making a patreon.com uh, or a donation to patreon.com slash Jordan Owen 42. Uh, as always, to our subscribers, thank you. Your uh, contributions are deeply appreciated. If you have any suggestions for books, movies, anything like that that you would like to see discussed on the Jordan Owen 42 program, Please let us know and check out Stefan's channel, for um, uh, which is uh, youtube.com slash smudboy, S-M-U-D-B-O-Y. It's your number one stop if you hate Bioware. So uh, there you go. And uh, signing off, Stefan, anything you want to say? Nope, we're good. All right. Well, thank you for listening and take care.